Thank you, Marina. Uh, it's great to be back. I love doing uh, webinars for, uh, for Charity Village. I think it's a great uh, group of networks from all different walks of life that, uh, you know, gather information and share information. Just to add to uh, what Marina said, I have added my email, so if you have any questions and you don't get an opportunity to uh, ask the questions or you want to have a discussion, feel free to email me. I, I'd be happy to, uh, to talk to you and help any way I can. Um, as well, I do have a Twitter account. I'm going to admit I have no idea how to use it, um, so, but please follow me and, uh, and I promise I'll get better at it. And on my uh, website, there's uh, lots of articles um, related to not only this topic, but other topics. So feel free to uh, take a look at that. Um, there I am. For those who I've not met before, for those who I have met before or taught before, um, hi. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background about uh, who I am. So I have worked in the field of volunteer management um, pretty much my whole career. Um, I'm not going to tell you how old or how long, but it's been a long time to the point where I feel like I'm at that, uh, you know, when I'm doing the research for this uh, presentation, there were a lot of aha moments for me as well, and I felt really old as I did this. Um, right now, um, so I spent roughly 25 years working in traditional nonprofit organizations, um, as well as associations, both locally and nationally. Um, I also am the co-developer and uh, faculty at Humber College, the Volunteer Management Leadership Program, um, and very, very, uh, um, Love, love teaching that um, and teach people from across Canada as well as the states. And I consult and I train in nonprofit volunteer management boards, associations, committees. So I am heavily embedded in this field um, and not quite sure what I would do if I wasn't in the field. I also sit on the board of directors for the International Journal of Volunteer Administration. So, uh, you know, I live what I talk and I talk what I live. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy the topic. It's a, it is a hot topic. Um, it is a topic that is uh, going to change quickly and drastically. Um, I think from a nonprofit perspective, uh, we have yet to even, you know, hit the tip of the iceberg on it. Um, I was actually listening to the news yesterday, and they were saying that the younger generation, they were focused more on high school university students, were saying that 41% are on Snapchat, and Facebook is the way that they talk to their grandparents. So I'm feeling a little on the grandparent side than I am on the Snapchat side. Um, so I just thought that was very interesting as we go through this because as uh, professionals in volunteer management, it is our core business, the way I feel it is, as our core business is to empower people um, and be the change leaders in the field of volunteer management. Um, you know, we are all busy. I understand that. We all run core volunteer programs um, and struggle with getting volunteers, retaining volunteers, working with staff, all these types of things. And just to add more fuel to the fire, we're now dealing with different generations that our um, expectations are very different, uh, not only from a volunteer to volunteer perspective, but also from a staff volunteer perspective. So, you know, I feel that we need to be really proactive and creative and understand our audience. So again, my background being marketing, to me, it's all about the audience and knowing what your audience wants. As you can see, um, this is from Volunteer Canada, um, that's the, the spectrum of engagement really starts by information. And, uh, you know, one of the key vehicles of information is using technology. And so one of the key takeaways of this presentation is really looking at how are you using technology? What does your website look like? And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But how can technology be used to inform? And where does the difference between the generations where the old generation wants to sit on the phone and have a phone conversation with you, where the younger generation is, don't call me. Okay, now they want text. I have a 22 year, a 23 year old and a 20 year old who, if I call, do not answer. Um, if I text, they answer. Sometimes I have to text and they're in the other room. So, you know, we're, we're kind of living what we're, what we're reading and uh, we need to really look at that. When you look at supporting volunteers, you know, is there really about the value to five minutes in the office or a quick text? And how will that affect, uh, you know, how people feel that they're being part of the, you know, part of the family, part of the organization? Active participation. I question that in terms of on whose terms. So historically, active participation has been to reach the goals and the expectations of the nonprofit organization, association, and so forth. 
but active participation is now kind of shifting towards the expectations of the volunteer and what they want to have. And then as we work towards leadership and growth, it really is about the gap. So, you know, we hear from the younger generation is that they want to learn, they want to uh, work towards leadership, but not in so much, not in such a traditional format. So one of your biggest challenges are, that, that I feel is going to be identifying the gaps and making a plan to remove those gaps. This is something you can't do alone. So <clears throat> this is, involves everybody who, from your leadership volunteers and your boards of directors to the staff that work with volunteers. Because one of the struggles that we have is we come up with great ideas, but then we hit the wall when the volunteer actually goes into the program and goes back to kind of the old way of just do it, you know, you should be here three hours a week for the next year. This is what your role is. It doesn't change. So the keys to success is understanding the gap, developing role descriptions that reflect not only the needs of the organization, but also the benefits to the volunteers and cultivating potential leadership and potential volunteers. And one tool that you can do to kind of look at all this is to do a SWOT analysis which is looking at your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats. So a takeaway from that is really looking at where do you see opportunities in your organization and where do you see some of your, um, some of your obstacles? You know, what internally is going on, what externally is going on? You still need to look at recruitment for diversity. To me, passion is really important. Experience, not only experience that volunteers have, but experience or the ability or willingness to learn. So the younger generation has the enthusiasm, has the, the, the networks, believe it or not, they do have a lot of networks, um, but they may not have experience. So, you know, are you shifting your volunteer program to look at ways to teach volunteers to be better volunteers, leaderships, um, different roles, allowing them to have opportunities to talk about, you know, I have a great idea that we could be doing, moving from a recreational program to a theme night uh, through high school classes. So, you know, opportunity for them to bring in their enthusiasm, but also for them to learn. I'll recruit for affiliation, expertise, but again, a balance, right? So when you're looking at recruitment, are you looking at, for example, boomers maybe wanting to you want to look at emphasizing values. Uh, boomers are more people focused, um, but still want impact. They want to communicate how their skills are used and how they can help versus looking at Gen Xers who are offering diversity. They, they want uh, unique experiences versus millennials who want opportunities to learn, are looking to the future and are looking for things like mentorship and coaching. So as you plan, with the focus of intergenerational volunteering, you need to plan according to looking at growth. Um, you need to have a plan, first of all, that's, that's a key thing. You need to work with staff um, because again, what you do at the front end in the recruitment stage needs to follow through, through the body of their volunteer life cycle, right into recognition um, and risk management. So we want to make sure that we're working with staff, that we're engaging others, um, communicating all through the process. So things, for example, an example from, from a communication perspective is uh, allowing your staff to know who's coming to you. So when I remember one organization that I worked at that I would send a monthly internal um, bulletin saying, these are the types of people that are coming to me asking to do volunteer work. Here are some ideas that they could be doing. Um, you know, look to your programs and are there opportunities to have a conversation about that? So ensuring that you're communicating as, you, as you're doing your planning, making sure that you're identifying your, your role blocks. So what are the goals for each generation? Because again, if you look at something like recruitment and you look to your Facebook page, really who are you attracting there? Remember I said we're, we're kind of focused more on the, uh, the the grandfather generation versus the younger generation who's really not looking at Facebook otherwise, other than to connect with family. So, you know, are we actually using our technology properly? 
And are we looking at the trends? Do you spend time in your workday? And, I, and anybody who's been on a webinar with me or a presentation that I've taught, I always say, please take time to read. We get so busy in what we do that we are constantly, you know, reacting to things. And I think it's really key and important to look at the trends, read uh, business articles and so forth, because they just prompt some amazing ideas. So I put the slide in more so that for your takeaway when you get it, but I want to highlight a couple of things, um, the key differences between the different generations. And really when you look at it, one of the key pieces is the social media and the technology. Um, you know, stars are made through YouTube. Um, change happens through uh, Twitter. Um, engagement, you know, people gather through tweets. Um, there's all kinds of information. Instagram is, is showing positive photos and connecting different kinds of organizations, different kinds of companies, like-minded impact, social impact groups together. So here's my, my um, honest confession. I personally don't know how to work to, to use Instagram in the right way. Um, so you know, make sure that you're looking at or bringing in the right people that have those skill sets. So for example, millennials are much more globally conscious. We know that, you see it in the paper all the time. They're looking for meaningful work. Uh, we know that people are now, organizations, companies, and so forth, recognize that they can teach the hard skills. What they're looking for are the soft skills. And those soft skills are, are, are uh, learned through volunteering. Um, they're looking for flexibility is also a very key difference. Where the boomers, so when you look at things like when you have a committee, where you have younger and older volunteers working together and you're sitting at the table and some are on their phones and others like just you know texting others are going that's ridiculously rude but here's the question is it right are we multitasking um, again just a couple of highlights in terms of the millennial generation that if you look at the fact that by 2025, 75% of the workforce, and I, when I see the workforce, I also think the volunteer force will be comprised of millennials. The other key thing is boomers are staying active, you know, up until 100. So there's a humongous amount of opportunity here, but there's a, a, a very large need to become more flexible as you go through the volunteer management cycle and look at how do you recruit according to the different generations? How do you retain according to the different generations? How do you recognize according to the different generations? So as an example, um, younger people do not want to go to the tea or the barbecue or the once a year. Or once a year. They want, and you can look, look at statistically here, they want opportunities to feel meaning, meaning in the work that they're doing, but that has to be an ongoing relationship and ongoing communication with um, with you. They want opportunities to lead, but they want the work-life balance and the ability to come in and out. And this is a real big one for us. So we come from a bit of a traditional model that we need volunteers to work three hours a week and commit to a year. In the foundations, yes, there are certain roles that have to work that way. But here's the problem. If you can't get the volunteers, is it actually working? So if you look at traditional um, volunteer positions like Meals on Wheels, they are struggling to get volunteers to get involved on a regular basis. So there is a fundamental shift happening where they're now looking at corporations to take on that commitment as a group, ensuring that the meals are provided, but you may not be um, onboarding them the same way you would have onboarded your traditional volunteers. The younger volunteers, not only younger, I'd say the boomers also, they want to work part-time, they want to volunteer part-time, they want to go to Florida. So what's to stop them from being a friendly visitor while they're in Florida? Um, you know, one of the things that, that, that I did in one of, one of my roles was looking at virtual volunteering. Like, again, where does technology become an asset? So I know some of you are going, the risk management, the risk management. Yes, there is some risk, but you know, trust, if you've done your due diligence, then having a FaceTime uh, face conversation 
with your, you know, your volunteer buddy and so forth, is that any different than going to do friendly visiting? And more and more seniors are buying or have access to technology. Um, you know, some of the biggest purchasers right now for technology, computers and iPads are the seniors. So we need to kind of look at how that, how that fits in. A couple of little things that I just kind of want to highlight, you know, Boomers, I only have five minutes. Millennials, I only have five seconds, right? So your conversation to talk to a potential volunteer, does it have to be done face-to-face -face, or is this something that you can text? How many conversations do we now have that we are texting more than we are talking? So statistically, again, in the survey that I heard on the news yesterday, um, was 39% of younger um, people are texting. 32% are talking. I then went to my 20-year-old son and said, is this, is this true? And he went, absolutely, I don't talk to anybody. And he doesn't. So, you know, again, having that attention span is a real issue for, uh, for volunteer programs because the attention span has changed quite a bit. Same with feedback, right? So feedback, you know, the older generation, the boomers, are, they understand the value of the work and they, and they connect it to the role description, right? It's all really about staying within the box. The millennials, the Gen Xers, you know, are really about, do you like what I'm doing? Which part did I do best? Um, you know, kudos on me. And even if they take an amazing job, guess where they post it? On their Twitter, on Instagram. They will self-promote themselves. Just had the best experience at the Walk to Fight Arthritis. Uh, just had a wonderful uh, time um, doing gift bags for a holiday program. They will be your ambassadors if they have great experiences. But you need to figure out ways to provide that feedback in a way that's meaningful to them. Interesting one here. So this is becoming a reality of uh, how we're communicating. So as you know, younger people, they're, and again, I'm gonna say it as a blanket statement and I'll use my, my children who are probably gonna hate me later on. Um, they can't spell. Uh, they're not, they, they don't know how to write. They were not, they weren't taught cursive, but they can emoji the heck out of any one of us. So, you know, is this professional? Is this the proper way to deal with those things? Um, is email the way to go? Uh, you know, is this the millennial, you know, hey, can we meet? Looks to me like a very excited person right now who wants to meet. So again, it's how the big picture is communication. How are you communicating? Is the volunteer newsletter a dying art? How are you using your, your, your website, right? There are opportunities to do very quick blasts. I get blasted daily from lots of nonprofits and lots of companies about, you know, interesting things. So is there a way that you actually can market and sell and communicate to your volunteers in a different way? And finally, it's that 24 seven generation. It's no longer nine to five. And if you want to book a meeting or do something between that nine to five, you may get pushback from, uh, from your volunteers um, because their lives are very different. They are not working nine to five and then will come to a meeting at six o'clock and then go home to their, you know, their wife and kids. They don't want to do these check-ins that are long and have no impact. So looking at how you communicate, can you do things like group chat? Um, can you, I'm teaching a webinar online. Are there ways for you to communicate with your volunteers online? So these are things that you need to start looking at. Um, if you look at this slide, it's really interesting, right? 80% want constant feedback and recognition. And again, 90% want to blend their, their life and their work life, which includes their volunteer life, because that is time being taken away from their personal life. And so you have to look at when you're planning your volunteer program, how do we blend in these types of things? Some of the benefits of having the multi-generational volunteer is the fact that there is more flexibility where you were kind of stuck in this nine to five or six to nine. You can now have volunteers, give them a project and they will work. They, you know, it's about the end game. It's not about the fact that they need to be somewhere. Um, it reflects what the true marketplace is telling you. I mean, if you look at things now, People don't even have offices anymore. It's the first one in the building gets the best uh, desk. So the younger generation is understanding that concept of there's no ownership, we're all in it together. Uh, decisions are stronger and broad based. So the fact that you have multi-generations working together gives you 
a larger landscape of impact and a larger understanding of what is going on, right? Because you're getting the diversity of, uh, of takeaways from the different people, and it's a great opportunity to innovate. So an example, like I said to you before, there was a high school that was, um, so uh, there was a hospital that had a, a youth volunteer program, and they built a partnership with the high school, and the, there was a youth advisory uh, committee, and that advisory committee came up with a brilliant idea of doing um, sports nights with the seniors. It was a, it was a senior's um, residence, and the class would come in during hockey season once a week and do theme nights. So depending on who that hockey team was playing, and there'd be games surrounded by it, there'd be, they'd have a hockey game on, um, there would be food related to that, and it was extremely innovative, and it really kind of blended in the generations between the seniors and the youth. So it's all about in innovation. Um, again, similarities, I just want to highlight a couple things, is that they all, I'm finding that whether you're older or younger, there is a shift to learning and a shift to so that people want to are lifelong learners. So whether you're at the point where you're working, um, uh, kind of closing down, you're still looking at opportunities to learn. So we need to make sure that we are giving our volunteers learning opportunities. And what a great way to do it is to learn from each other. So is there an opportunity here for coaching or mentorship between volunteer to volunteer? Again, the same thing. We're finding that more and more volunteers want to have that flexibility. And that's a big challenge for us because, like I said, there's still that traditional model of, you know, we need volunteers to be here at this time, at this desk, for this amount of hours, for one year. Now, we all know that that one-year commitment is, is something that we can put on paper, but what are we going to do if they're not going to come in? So where is that ability to be flexible where a volunteer says, I can commit for three months, but then I'm going to go away to Florida for three months, and then I'll come back. And you have a student that says, I can commit through the holiday season and through summer, but during the school year that I can't come in. Is there an opportunity here to even role share, right, so that everybody kind of gets what they want? So like I said, it's about that flexibility and finding things that you can do. So let's look at some strategies. You need to understand and respect the differences in the way people work and the communication style. Um, and again, it's a, a 45 minute webinar. I'm gonna give you some ideas at the end here, but you gotta do your homework and you gotta do some research. You need to look at adapting your training and development to the different styles of learning. So like I said, there are people that can sit in a room and learn no problem. Um, there are those that need snippets of learning. Um, you know, there's a whole different way of learning visually versus there is orally. So adapt your training and your development to look at the younger generation. Maybe you're putting quick, quick YouTube videos out on uh, support learning. So not the core business, but did you know that, um, uh, did you know that healthy eating can do, can help your, you know, uh, help our clients to, um, feel good about themselves, right? As a volunteer, you can talk about, you know, uh, healthy choices in eating with, with, when you do your friendly visiting. Um, tap into the knowledge that all these generations are bringing to them. So the older generations, the boomers, the organizational structures that we still kind of hold onto and are dear to our, dear to our heart, they have a wealth of information through the many years that they've been working um, versus the younger generation that holds on to this wealth of technology, social media, networking, um, impact, um, you know, connecting to, to others. There's a lot of knowledge out there that we may not have that, but why don't we bring the right volunteer in to teach us how to do that? Offer flexible working options and know the difference between recognition and appreciation. So, in, you know, recognition is really about the impact and the work that, that, that volunteers have done, is recognizing the work that they've done, is done more in a formal, in a formal way, the award system, the, the, the certificates, those types of things, 
but that ongoing appreciation, which is more than, you know, thank you, more than that letter, but what does appreciation look like? And how can you appreciate reflective of the type, the, the, the kind of volunteer that you have? So, you know, still the youth, the younger volunteers love the certificates because they're on the, they're the learning curve right now. But those 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, uh, the value of those certificates right now are not important to them, right? Is it about a reference slide that they can, that they can hold on to for their next employment opportunity? Provide some independence for volunteers um, so that they have an opportunity to grow and create a fun work environment. So let's talk about some ideas. Um, again, tip of the iceberg at this point, just as a, a listing of ideas, we can look at new roles. And some suggestions of new roles could be a team leader. So we talk about volunteer programs that have a lot of volunteers and a part-time volunteer coordinator. Is there an opportunity here to develop leadership roles for volunteers that they can actually lead teams of volunteers? So basically like your own um, management team of volunteers. You know, we're, I find that we're the worst at getting our own volunteers to help us. We're all busy helping everybody else, but we're not actually helping ourselves. But this is an opportunity for uh, volunteers to lead volunteers and to share their experience with volunteers. What about a role of project manager? Somebody who's responsible for ensuring that a project, you know, goes from start to finish. So a key volunteer that helps out uh, for a holiday meal. And their role is to make sure that all the, the um, uh, all the, the, the wheels are moving and that uh, they're working with you. But again, they're kind of in the trenches and you're um, organizationally you know, accountable but making sure that it's being done. But the actual role of project manager, look at that from a volunteer perspective that they now have a role as a, vol as a volunteer project manager. Uh, coaching and mentoring. So this is something that is being done um, where older volunteers, and I, and when I use the word older, I also mean those that have experienced volunteering are mentoring those that are just coming into the volunteer uh, volunteer um, landscape. So what a great opportunity, or a board member who is mentoring a younger professional who's coming in to do volunteer work. Uh, what about trainers? Volunteers as trainers. Um, so again, opportunities for volunteers to not only learn, but use the skills that they have. Uh, where they're training younger volunteers. And finally, a consultant, a volunteer consultant, who brings in their expertise for a specific project or scope of work, which then kind of ticks off the box of flexibility, uh, being able to use their soft skills, uh, gaining experience or sharing experience. Um, I had an example of, of a gentleman who worked in a large corporation in the human resource department and did management training. And so he actually checked off both boxes. We didn't look, we don't look for volunteers that do management training, but part of, you know, being that creative side of figuring out what a volunteer can do, as I had the conversation beyond an interview, because many of my interviews have always done, like when I see something, I kind of go off the traditional interview and go into the conversation, um, was I broached the idea of him doing management training, developing um, a program for our staff and some of our leadership volunteers. And so he would go down south in the winter, he would develop the program, and then he would himself train uh, three times uh, a year and then go back and redevelop or, or add, the, you know, add uh, content. And uh, it went, it, it, A, it was a, it was a beautiful way to use his skills it was a great way for him to engage. And also he then taught what he had been trained to do, working with um, you know, new, new people in the workforce, the whole intergenerational, like I think one of his workshops was even on communication and management dealing with intergenerational uh, stuff. So one of the key ones, like I said, was project-based volunteering. And this one I think is really important um, if we look at what we're doing, if we look at our core volunteer business, how much of our volunteer or our organizational's work can be done on a project basis? 
activity. So again, it's, it's us looking at how we can, sorry, engage volunteers in a meaningful way, but respond to the fact that they don't want to be committed um, on a long-term basis, okay? And statistics are telling us that's not what they want. Now, in reality, they may actually want more, but we don't know that. So there's a fear factor going in where, you know, when you ask people to sit on a committee or chair a committee, nobody wants to chair a committee, right? Um, chairing a committee is probably one of the easiest jobs you can have because you are the conductor of that group. Um, so what they don't know, they will always kind of fear factor back. People who have been experienced, who have been in the workforce, who have been uh, volunteering for a long time, don't have as much fear in terms of connecting to an organization. The younger volunteer wants to get involved in what they want to get involved in fairly immediately, but don't really understand how they can connect. So again, it's about project. If you look at project-based volunteers, look at impact, um, how they can make a difference, and have a high impact for a short period of time. So that's one idea. Another idea that I actually um, heard about through an association is an ambassador program. So volunteers, especially the younger volunteers, going in and using their connections. The younger volunteer is highly connected. I think we, we don't even understand how, how this works. I can give you an example that I find quite, quite interesting. Um, the movie Rich Crazy Asians, one of the stars, I don't know her name, came through her YouTube channel where she was um, blogging, video blogging, um, kind of life, all kinds of things, and got a significant amount of hits, enough that the entertainment industry took notice, and now she's a thriving, you know, hot actress. So there's a lot of connections here that we just don't even realize where people are connected. And if you go and you take a look at, um, uh, you know, again, looking at social media, looking at Twitter, looking at uh, YouTube, even, look, even look, looking at LinkedIn and seeing who is, who's writing a lot, who's connecting a lot, um, there are these opportunities for people to connect to others. So, you know, this is what the younger generation does well um, and does best. So ambassador programs, opportunities for high school visits, community outreach, community events, going in and talking to corporations and speaking engagements would be another great way of not only creating new kinds of volunteer work for the younger generation, but even connecting the older and the younger generation together. Education training seminars and volunteer shadowing. So the Leaders of Tomorrow concept, where you can connect the two generations um, and all the points in between, between those that have been steady volunteers for many years that can share, teach, empower, and educate younger volunteers. So in my head, I'm thinking the hospital sector, where you have these core volunteers that have been around for many, many years, um, and maybe even doing the same role for many, many years. Giving them an opportunity to educate, to train, and to allow you know, younger volunteers to shadow because we're going to need a smooth um, changeover as well. And there, even though you know, volunteers have been in roles for long periods of time, do we actually know whether they want to stay in those roles? So another opportunity for the, two, the multiple generations to work together would be a Leaders of Tomorrow or an Education or a Role Shadowing. Your website. So another takeaway, and I know we're kind of running out of time here, um, is please look at your website. And then go ask somebody who is younger, um, maybe one of your volunteers, maybe a friend, maybe one of your kids, and ask them to look at your website. And I'm going to clearly say specifically on your volunteer pages. So I do a lot of work with nonprofits, and I talk to a lot of people, and when I do, my, when I do workshops, um, and I'll always say, when was the last time you looked at your website? So if I see a website that really just has, here are the volunteer roles, here's a small description. If you're interested, please contact or click on this link. Boom, done, finished. 
How interesting is that? How exciting is that? Again, from a generational standpoint, your website is your gatekeeper. It is going to be what either interests them or what turns them away. And we know that people are looking to the volunteer pages now or they're looking to the engagement pages. So they're looking beyond that home page. So, and you control that page. That is yours to do. And if it's not yours to do, then you need to have another conversation with the staff member because you need to be generational friendly. You need to be visual. You need to look at the impact and how volunteering will impact all those different generations um, and the value and the benefits. So use that. That is prime real estate. Uh, your website page. So make sure that you're not wasting that that real estate page because I've seen the volunteer pages where half of it's empty or it's all photos of you know from recognition events. So please look to your website and look at how can you connect to your audience through your volunteer pages. Again, you're going to have this information if you're going to build a mentorship program. There's a couple of key things you need to recognize. It is a formal kind of program. There's an expectation from the mentee and from the mentor that things are going to happen when they both agree to happen, which is very different from a coaching program. So if anybody's been a mentor or a mentee, especially from the mentor side, because I, I have been a mentor, is we will go out of our way to teach and empower and engage and help out any way we can. But there's an expectation of uh, workflow expectation, checkpoints, and what is the measure of success at the end of that? Okay, so if you're going to go into the world of mentorship where you're mentoring younger and older volunteers together, please take the time to come up with kind of a formal plan because what will happen is if it's not formalized with the expectations, especially from the mentee side, it will fall apart, the mentor will get upset, the mentor will leave. Okay. Um, the other thing with mentorships is that it is about more than just the individual learning. It's about the growth of the program, building to leadership, succession planning, all these types of things, and that connection between the mentor and the mentee. So there is a lot of work that needs to be put into it if you're going to build a mentorship program. Coaching is a little bit more, um, a little bit more broader, I think. There's lots of ways that you can coach. And I think coaching is a great way to kind of bridge the intergenerational gaps in volunteering. Um, I think a younger volunteer that's going to help out on, uh, on an event, but as well gets an opportunity to be coached um, from an expert in uh, you know, a particular area or coached in terms of just life, you know, life lessons. But you have to be careful that you need to know who is accountable for what. Um, what are they accountable for? What supports are you going to provide? What resources are you going to provide? And again, make sure that you have a plan if you're going to do these types of coaching things. So these are a whole bunch of area ideas that need to be formed, I think, more. So again, this is the first conversation that we're having. Um, there is a lot of information out there. Um, you know, if I can help in any way, I will. But it's looking at the volunteer experience between the younger generation, so if you go back to that boomer generation who is going to be a force to be reckoned with in the next 10 years because as they are um, traditionally working their way out of the workforce, they are working their way into the volunteer force. At the same time, you have university graduates, college graduates, high school graduates who have having troubles finding work and are using volunteering to gain experiences, you have that middle group that is in their 30s right now that understands the value of volunteering, not only for themselves individually, but for their families, and are looking for experiences beyond the traditional let's go out and help you know, pick apples or those types of things. So it's not an easy task to manage the, the generation, but the key point to take away are looking to the creativity. How can you take your volunteer program and be more creative on recruitment, on retention, on acknowledgement and recognition? And I have not ignored the fact that there are risk management issues here, 
but I think that we also need to look at that as well and how do we process our risk management? Like, is it one size fit all? Does everybody have to have a police check? Um, you know, depending on the role. To me, it always comes down to the role. And looking at best practice models from other organizations, um, as well as going to both your staff and your volunteers to ask for ideas because they kind of know what they want to do at this point. And that's the real difference. The fundamental shift is I will help you, but I want to see impact. I want to feel different. I want to learn something. I want to feel that there's an opportunity for leadership and growth. And I guess my question back to you is, can all of you answer yes to all those things? And if you can't, then you need to look at how can we build in an intergenerational model to our traditional model. So finally, you know, I spent 45 minutes or so talking about some great ideas, some, some challenges you have. The question now that I take back to you is, what are you going to do with this presentation, this webinar, um, and who can you get to help you? Um, you know, your colleagues in our field, we are very much uh, connected to each other and try and help each other. But please take a couple of minutes after this webinar and come up with, you know, if, if I was live, I'd be saying to you, write down three things you're going to do that, or three things that you learned from this that you're going to take on to next steps. So thank you for the time. Um, I appreciate it. And uh, it's kind of weird because I can't see your faces and my hands have been moving up and down like crazy because that's what I do. And uh, I'll open up to questions and feel free to reach out anytime. And I hope to see you again um, or write another article on this and hope you read it. Anyhow, thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Lori. Uh, lots of great stuff uh, in that presentation. And I, I think speaking from the Charity Village uh, perspective, a lot of what you're talking about in terms of volunteer management falls into what we often say about HR management as well, which is, you know, managing the different generations really comes down to good management, right? It's all sure. good, good uh, management uh, practices. So um, good stuff. Let's uh, dive into some questions. So. Um, we talked a lot about providing meaningful feedback and, you know, that is something that we also see again in the HR side of things and again comes down to you really solid management practices for all generations I mean, all generations benefit from getting meaningful feedback. So can you um, maybe talk a little bit more about uh, how to do that as a volunteer manager, Lori? Um, sure. So, you know, it's, it's funny to talk about the feedback concept because um, I think that's where the, the different generations kind of rear their ugly heads, right? So, you know, we look at opportunities, um, you know, so, sometimes sitting down, sitting down and having a conversation has so much value to it. But some generations, especially the younger ones, to them, if you sit down with them, they've done something wrong. So I think that, again, like you said, we have to listen to what our volunteers want. Um, we know that volunteers want feedback not only on their role, but also on the impact of what they've done, or, or the impact of change management, what happens with the change. So there is a big piece of impact, and, and when they start to understand the impact, it actually engages them further. So feedback is, you know, we look at feedback from us giving feedback to the volunteers, but we also need to look at the volunteers giving us feedback. So to answer your question, again, there's, I would use technology a little bit. Um, I would use, I would send out surveys. I would use opportunities to sit down with volunteers if they, if they have the time. I would use opportunities when they're engaged in an activity after, so kind of like that post-mortem and that, and that feedback opportunity. I know after events or activities, volunteers are not involved in the feedback mechanism of those. It's like the staff get together and do a post-mortem, but the volunteers don't. So, you know, looking at these kinds of opportunities and different ways to do it um, is important. I think I answered the question. That's that's great. I, missed, I may miss a couple of points here because I think it's a I think it's a bigger I think it's actually a bigger conversation. But the two key, key the two key takeaways for me on that is 
you provide feedback, but how can they provide feedback to you? And maybe you just need to ask them, what is the best way for us to get information from you? I think that's a great point, Lori. Um, Don't idea, assume. Yeah, the idea of doing feedback, um, you know, is, is so important because, uh, you know, when it, what it comes down to is, is we need to be connecting with the volunteers to find out, you know, individually what's working for them. It's all well and good for us to look at statistics and sort of large blanket statements. But if yeah. volunteers in your volunteer program want something different, that's what you need to be connected with. So, um, But don't confuse feedback to performance management. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the key difference. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense, and it comes back to that uh, importance of of emphasizing impact, which is is so key. Um, so huge now. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit then. Um, just you know, in in your experience, are you seeing a difference in the type of uh, volunteering or the length of volunteering that is uh, attractive to the different generations? Um, absolutely. So. When I say, you know, I, my last couple of roles have been um, working with uh, health charities and so forth. So some of it has to do with the organization, but there is absolutely a shift to um, full commitment, but less time. So people do not want to commit to that year anymore. And I just don't see the meaning of that. I think if a volunteer is committed and um, it works, they're going to do everything they can to ensure that they can continue on their role. But the fact is that, that there's a fear factor in putting a timeline on volunteering. So people are more interested in, in dipping their toes in the waters before they dive in. There's a fundamental shift towards that. I want to help, but I don't know how I can help. Now, how do you solve some of those problems? One of them is exactly what I said at the beginning. Give them more information on the front end. So maybe they will commit right from the beginning, you know, and have a better understanding. We tend to not give them a lot of information. We tend to spend our time screening them, but not giving them any information. So an example being is, and, and I find this interesting, again, when you ask them to tick off in the application box, I would like to, and you list all of your roles, and I'm willing to make a one-year commitment. Well, people are going to tick off whatever you want them to tick off, but it doesn't mean anything. And why are you asking them to tick off that I want to do fundraising and I want to do this? They have no idea what your organization is about. So I think there's a fundamental, fundamental um, fear in committing to forever. They don't want to get married. They just want to date. And if they like it, then maybe you'll go common law. And if they really like you, you'll have a marriage ceremony. Hopefully no divorce. I think that's a, a great point, Lori, because uh, we tend to forget that when we're talking about, um, you know, or we often remember that when we talk about boomers, we're talking about sandwich generation and caring for, yeah. you know, elder parents, um, you know, still have, uh, sometimes still have children at home. Uh, but we forget that uh, when we're talking about millennials, we're often talking about um, volunteers that are juggling family and work commitments. Um, yeah. They're busy. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're in peak career. You know, they're maybe moving into management positions in their careers and are, are yep. stretched for time. And when we drill right down to Gen Z, I mean, they're in college. They're, they're busy as well. So uh, it completely makes sense that uh, folks want to be careful uh, I think if we think about any of us signing on to a volunteer position, we want to be careful about what we are committing to. Um, so that, that information piece is so key. Yeah. I mean, the, the couple of major points on that is nobody wants to disappoint an organization, right? So anybody who commits to doing volunteer work or has taken those steps really wants to make help, but they don't want to disappoint. And you make a really good point. You know, I'm finding, especially with the boomer generation, they are going, their, their fear is that they are going to be full-time caregivers of their parents. So they're making sure that they are giving themselves that flexibility in case something happens. Like I have friends now that are not working full-time that are working part-time because they're almost preparing for the fact that they may have to help out in ways they never thought they'd have to help out. Whether it's their children they have to help out or whether it's their parents they have to help out. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Such a great point. Um, yeah, I, I mean, all of the generations are, are facing those issues just from, from different uh, angles, right? So Correct. Um, let's jump into stewardship a little bit. Do you have some suggestions on, on stewardship? Um, can you follow up on that one? What do you mean? Stewardship is a very big word. Yeah, so let's um, talk about, um, we've talked a little bit about the uh, meaningful um, feedback and, and communicating impact. Um, but I know in your presentation, you also mentioned, um, you know, younger volunteers are not going to be generally so interested in the annual recognition luncheon, which is often what we see organizations yep. kind of relying upon. Um, do you, do you have some tips, uh, or have you seen some different ideas for stewardship that are maybe a little bit more engaging on an ongoing basis for, for different generations? Yeah, so like I mentioned in the presentation, so stewardship is kind of like, you know, when we look at that fundraising, that fundraising model where it takes, um, and again, I'm not a fundraiser, uh, four to five points of contact before you're fully engaged, right? You can kind of take that next level. So if you go back into the presentation, we talked a lot about education um, and, uh, and ways to engage volunteers, not just from the volunteer perspective. So what, you know, what we're trying to do with volunteering is, my take has always been, is the end game is they're ambassadors, right? We always want our volunteers to feel really good about what they're doing and that they're going to, you know, you ask two people who will ask two people who will ask two people. We, the perfect concept is we never have to recruit because our volunteers are recruiting for us. The concept of stewardship and stewarding our, the, our relationship with the volunteers is Three things. One, understanding what they want, and sometimes we have to ask them. And whether that's getting a group of volunteers and saying, how do you want to be acknowledged or recognized? Right? What is important to you? In fact, you know, at the top of kind of thinking, maybe we, if we ask that question in an application form, what's important to you about volunteering? Like, what, what would you want a volunteer program to support you with? that maybe that's really an interesting question to find out right from the beginning why they're why they want to get engaged so things like education uh providing um and it doesn't have to be live but provi providing let's say youtube videos on program uh development so volunteers also want to understand more than the, the department that they're in right so stewarding relationships is really about getting them fully engaged in the organization that they're working with. So many times the volunteers really only see the part that they're a part of, but they don't really see the other part, which then goes back to that impact. So it, to me, it's about uh, a variety of touch points, education, communication, uh, sharing information, and trying to gather information. To me is how you're going to steward a positive relationship and acknowledge the work that they're doing. Fantastic. Um, now let's uh, go back to the um, website uh, stuff that you were talking about. Do you oh, have yeah. some, some tips on, uh, you know, maybe some different things that people could consider adding to their volunteer page that, that might be a little more engaging? Number one, benefits. What is the value add to getting involved in the organization? Two, impact. Highlight some of the, the ways that volunteers have impacted. You have the you have the knowledge there because you've been running volunteer programs for many years. You know the impact of the volunteers. You know, remember when your executive director says to you, "I need some information because I'm going for a grant. I need to, some really good news stories." That stuff I think needs to be on the volunteer page. People feel better knowing that 1,000 volunteers did 5,000 hours in this organization in 2018. They feel like they're connecting to something that, okay, this actually works. Uh, or, you know, it, it, there's something happening. Um, I think testimonials, I, I'm all about stories, good news stories. Again, I think there's a bit, a bit of weariness on it. Are they fake? Are they real? That kind of stuff. Um, I also believe that the role descriptions, you don't need to throw the whole role description into the volunteer page, but do a really good paragraph summarization of the kinds of roles. So I don't need to see your whole role description on the page because it really doesn't matter. They're not looking down on qualifications because really the qualifications are 
negotiated when you do the meeting, right? So benefits, impact, thumb stats, pictures, visuals, um, stories, absolutely some of your highlighted volunteer roles. Um, if you're looking at youth, so maybe even do a section on corporate, section on youth, section on um, um, uh, connect, connecting volunteers to volunteers, like use that kind of marketing brain, uh, you know, and, and come up with some unique things um, and have those kinds of, it could be a, a blurb on that page or they could drill down to the next page. So focus on youth volunteering as its own page. Focus on professional development and volunteers as its own page under the youth tab, under the volunteer tab, uh, recruitment tab. Those are some ideas. Wonderful. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Lori. I think we're going to um, call it there because we're coming up on time. So um, thanks so much again for uh, joining us today. I, I love the fact that really the emphasis of the whole presentation is, is really looking at creativity and, and how how you can think differently about your volunteer program. Um, and I think that's a, a great thing for, for everyone to uh, walk away with. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. So before we sign off, I just want to remind you all that we are going to follow up uh, by email tomorrow with the full webinar recording and you'll get the slide deck as well. Uh, we'll have a short survey there. Uh, it takes less than five minutes to fill out. I hope that you'll um, complete that for us if you can. You will have the opportunity there to let us know if there's other topics you'd like to see covered in a future session also. So um, please do weigh in on, on that question. Um, I hope that you'll all join us on October 4th. We've got uh, Volunteer Canada coming uh, to talk about the UN's sustainable development goals uh, and how those relate to your volunteer program. So it should be a very interesting conversation. I will include a link to that webinar and the registration in the email that you get tomorrow in case you'd like to sign up for that. And with that, I'd like to thank you all again for joining us today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.